Ruth, Israelite or Moabite? Most Christians presume Ruth to be a racial Moabite, imagining the Old Testament story to be one about breaking God's law, and then later even going as far to try to picture Christ as a hypocrite with a corrupted genealogy. Today we're going to, and hopefully in a concise yet effective manner, defend Ruth and decisively prove her Israelite ancestry. This has been done before many times, but seldomly in an effective video format. Now, before we begin to defend Ruth, we're going to give a brief summary of her story. Her story is found in a book of the Old Testament, which is dedicated to her, and it takes place during the Judges period. Now, during the time of Ruth, there is a famine in Judah, and for reason of the crisis, Elimelech and his wife Naomi travel to the land of Moab. There they have two sons, Milan and Kilon, who both marry women in the region, Orpah and Ruth. Now by the end of ten years, Elimelech and his two sons, they have passed away. With her husband and two sons dead, and hearing that the famine in Judah has ended, Naomi plans to return to Judah. Widows were very vulnerable during this time. Orpah and Ruth are distraught because not only have they lost their husbands, but now they're going to also lose their mother-in-law. Orpah leaves, returns to her village, but Ruth decides to continue on with Naomi. She follows her back to Judah, and there she is introduced to Boaz, her late husband's apparent closest relative who is obligated to take her in, as per the law of kinsman redemption. However, Ruth learns from Boaz that her late husband had an even closer relative who therefore the obligation falls towards first. So Boaz continues and confronts this man, informs him of the situation. But the individual rejects his responsibility as kinsman redeemer. Because this man refuses to take on Ruth, Boaz is naturally next in line, and he fulfills the law of kinsman redemption. And together, the couple bear Obed, the father of Jesse, and Ruth therefore becomes an earthly ancestor of Christ. That is a summary of the story of Ruth. And now because the story of Ruth takes place in the judges period, we should also look at the history of Moab leading up until then. This will help us understand the conditions of the land during the lifetime of Ruth. When the Israelites entered Canaan, they were instructed by Yahweh God to slay certain inhabitants of the land. The Moabites were one of these people, and one of the few where the Israelites actually, for the most part, followed the commandment which was given to them. Numbers 21 tells us that Sion, the king of the Amorites, had taken all the land of Moab and also the Moabites therein captive before the Israelites arrived. Then, concerning Sion, in Deuteronomy 2, we read, Then Sion came out against us, he and all his people, to fight at Jahaz. And Yahweh our God delivered him before us. We smote him, and his sons, and all his people. And we took all his cities at that time, and utterly destroyed the men and the women and the little ones of every city. We left none to remain. The Israelites then went on to occupy the land of Moab, destroying both the Amorites and Moabites who had dwelt there. 
And there are enough verses relating to this that Bible teachers on the subject of Ruth really have no excuse for their ignorance. Here are some. Most of us know that the Israelites were famously given the commandment to destroy the Canaanites. And we see that the Moabites are one of the few instances where the Israelites devotedly followed the command. It is well known that later on, west, across the Jordan, the Israelites had, for the most part, compromised and left many Canaanites alive, for which Yahweh God rebuked them and they suffered the consequences of their own devices, and we still suffer to this day. But as for the lands east of the Jordan, we see that the Israelites had, indeed, for a great part, succeeded. After the original inhabitants were destroyed or driven out, much of the land was then given to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. We read this in Deuteronomy 3, verses 12 to 16. In this land which we possessed at that time, from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh, and unto the Reubenites. And unto the Gadites I gave from Gilead, even unto the river Arnon, half the valley, and the border, even unto the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. So we see that the land of Moab was then inhabited by the Reubenites, Gadites, and by a portion of the tribe of the Manassites. Often in history, when the original inhabitants of a land are displaced, it is not uncommon, for sake of convenience, that the newer inhabitants take on the older and still relatively known name of the land. For example, the state of Alabama is named after the Alabama, a tribe of Native Americans who lived there previously. Now today, someone who lives in Alabama is still called Alabaman. But common sense tells us that your typical Alabaman today is not a Native American, but rather European, or at least some other group. And we know that because we know the basic history of Alabama. If one is reading any piece of literature and Alabama is mentioned, and an Alabaman therein, it is foolish to assume them to be automatically, by default, a Native American. That same common sense tells us about the situation in the land of Moab during the time of Ruth. In her time, and much like her own time now, many men identified themselves more so by geography rather than solely by their tribe. We see this in David and Saul, despite David being a Judahite and Saul being a Benjamite. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, we see a list of some of David's mightiest warriors who are all named by geography. These events we're speaking of first started to take place circa 1450 BC. And Ruth was also alive during the wider Judges period. In Judges 11.26, we see that by the time of Jephthah, the Israelites had possessed the land of Moab for 300 years. With this context in mind, we see that during a time of famine in the land of Judah, Elimelech and his wife Naomi had traveled across the Jordan to Moab, a place where many of their kin, Reubenites, Gadites, and Manassites, dwelled, and they dwelled there for a long time. Now, it was explicitly forbidden in the law for an Israelite to enter into marriage with a Moabite. We read in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, An Ammonite 
or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever. This line is found only one line after the famous verse concerning the exclusion of bastards. Moabites themselves were bastards. They could not trace their lineage purely back to any of Noah's sons, having mixed with Kenites at an earlier time. Any union with a Moabite woman would rear bastard offspring and transgress the law. Now there is no doubt that Ruth and Orpah were ethnic Israelites dwelling in the land of Moab, most likely of the tribes of Reuben, Gad, or Manasseh. And this is why Elimelech's sons had taken their hands in marriage. When Ruth travels back to Judah with Naomi, the law of kinsman redemption becomes of immediate importance for her. This law was in place so that when an Israelite man died, his nearest of kin would take his wife and bring up seed for him, so that his name would not be lost in Israel. This also provided protection to widows at a time when widows and the fatherless were some of the most vulnerable people in society. The responsibility of kinsman redemption was therefore a very serious one, and Ruth went to Boaz so that he could fulfill the role of kinsman redeemer. Ruth believed Boaz to be her late husband's nearest of kin, and Boaz even notes her righteousness in seeking him out. However, Boaz first mentions in his own act of goodness that there is one of nearer kin than he, and that he will first approach this man to see if he will take Ruth in. There are two major signals here that Ruth was indeed an Israelite. The first being that kinsman redemption was even applicable to her. Boaz is a man of good character that is very visible in the account. He is following and respecting the law of God. He is zealous for it and commending Ruth for her similar fervor and dedication. Now, if she were a Moabite by race and not by geography, then Boaz, who so clearly respects the law, would have cited that same law and cast her away. The second signal is equally significant. And that is when we see that this man of nearer kin whom Boaz mentions and later approaches refuses to follow his obligation of being a kinsman redeemer. For apparently, he doesn't want to share his inheritance with any woman or possible sons. The punishment of refusing to fulfill your obligation of kinsman redemption was a serious one. In Deuteronomy, we read, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe 
from off his foot, and spit in his face, and shall answer, and say, So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, The house of him that has his shoe loosed. This man apparently wanted the inheritance which the son of Elimelech had left behind, meaning his estate. At least, this is what the account in Ruth seems to imply. He initially accepts to redeem the estate, but when he learns that the man had had a wife, he refuses. He then looses his shoe before the elders, an acceptance of his punishment according to this relatively in comparison to other laws, more obscure one. If he was aware of this obscure law, then he also most certainly would have been aware of an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever. Citing this would have allowed him to both avoid punishment and also the damage on his reputation, and he would have inherited that estate. This law was well known, and a man who is aware of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, would also of course be aware of the much more recognized, important, and significant Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. But he doesn't cite it, and that's because Ruth was an Israelite. Ruth even affirms it in her own words. In the King James Version, we read Ruth tell Naomi in Ruth 1.16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to return from following after you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. The words shall be are added to the text. They are in italics, and they are not in the original text of the Hebrew. Brendan also added shall be in his translation of the Septuagint, and neither is it found in the Greek there. This is because translation is always in part interpretation, and these men were adding words to the text to try to shape it into what they imagined it to be. There is no future tense in the words of the passage here either, not in the Hebrew of the Masoretic, nor in the Greek of the Septuagint. Ruth is not indicating anything to happen in the future, but is rather making a statement, a plain statement, to Naomi. Her words read very frankly, Your people, my people, and your God, my God. Some Bible translations do render this verse honestly, such as Yun's literal translation, which reads, And Ruth says, Urge me not to leave you, to turn back from after you. For where you go, I go. And where you lodge, I lodge. Your people are my people, and your God, my God. Not even the Latin, where it reads only, Again, my people, your people, and my God, your God. Ruth is making a statement to Naomi that she will return with her to Judah because they are the same people and they share the same God. At the end of the book of Ruth, we see that Ruth is celebrated for her righteousness and compared the woman who came before her, Israelite woman, like Rachel, Leah, and Tamar. She is also spoken of as being part of building a house, much like Rachel and Leah both took a part in building the house of the tribes of Israel. And Tamar gave us the houses of Perez and Zerah. This is, of course, prophetic, with Ruth being a grandmother of David, lending her hand toward the house of David and the ultimate seat of Christ. These honors could never be given to a bastard. 
Jacob traveled to Bedan Aram to find the wives of his own kin, and there he found Rachel and Leah. Tamar went to great lengths to assure that the seed of Judah would be preserved, and being upright, she is remembered as a righteous woman. Ruth, just like Tamar, also fought hard to preserve the seed of Israel, and for this, she should be remembered admirably. But instead, she is slandered. She is called a racial Moabite, and her tale of righteous dedication to the law is turned into a propaganda piece for fornication. It is very important that Ruth is read correctly. If Ruth were a Moabite by race, then all of her descendants would have been bastards, and Christ, his claim to the throne, would have been illegitimate. Many elements of scripture stand there for us as a test. Will men believe in a God who follows his own law? Or will they cling to Pharisaism? The Ruth story can either be interpreted fancifully, that the law of God was broken that day, that no one spoke a word of it, that David was a bastard, and that God himself condones the breaking of his own law. Or it can be read honestly, with the proper context and the proper reasoning. Simply, God cannot break his own law, even dying for us, to show the extent to which he will go in order to keep his law, to fulfill it, and to keep his promises which he made to our fathers. Ruth was an Israelite by race, and an example of a righteous woman who went to great lengths to fulfill the law of God. One day will soon come, where no one will slander Ruth or any of those people recorded in our Bibles who strived to do righteous things in this life. Thank you for watching. Praise Yahweh, the God of Israel.